Okay, so welcome to this next video on uh, the Vogelstein model for colorectal carcinoma. So, so far what we have seen is uh, that you start off with a cell, a normal cell in the colonic epithelium. This first cell is unlucky enough to suffer two loss of function mutations in the APC gene. That leads to it over-dividing and creating a whole population of cells which are genetically identical to it and which all have uh, loss of function in both APC genes. Now, within that population of cells, all with uh, two loss of function mutations in uh, APC, uh, you uh, get the next progr uh, to progress to the next level of uh, the colorectal car carcinoma progress. Uh, you need to um, have one of those cells in that green population that is unlucky enough to suffer another mutation. And this next mutation is a gain of function mutation in a KRAS, uh, one of the KRAS genes. That then leads to that cell dividing even more rapidly than it did with the um, two loss of function mutations in APC. So it produces a whole population of cells genetically identical to it, and this is these pink cells, which all have two loss of function mutations in APC, as well as a gain of function mutation in a single KRAS gene. Now, the next, uh, that, at that stage it's known as an intermediate adenoma. The next stage is for one of these um, uh, pink cells which has uh, two loss of function mutations in its APC genes and one gain of function mutation in its KRAS gene uh, to get uh, two loss of function mutations in SMAD4 and then that leads to it growing even more rapidly, it leads to it dividing even more rapidly still, and it produces a population of cells genetically identical to it, which then have two loss of function mutations in ABC, one gain of function mutation in KRAS, and loss of function in both of the SMAD4 genes. Okay, so the next stage then, one of these cells is going to get a mutation in the tumor suppressor protein P53. So this is the final mutation, and this takes you into cancer, basically. Okay, so let me explain the pathway by which P53 operates. And we're going to specifically look at the pathway uh, by which P53 um, controls, uh, well, tries to control cells which have had DNA damage. So, uh, well, how it's involved in the response to DNA damage. So let's say a... Um, a cell's DNA is damaged. Maybe it gets a mutation or something bad happens to it, basically. Okay, so the archetypal example is a double-strand break. Okay, so let's say um, some X-rays are going to come in and they're going to cause the DNA to break down the middle here. Okay, so the DNA is going to break into two portions. All right, so let's show this. So the DNA has now broken into two portions. Okay, so this is a double strand break. So this is an example of uh, DNA damage, but there are other examples. So a double strand break is a specific example of um, DNA damage that can be caused by x-rays, double strand break. Okay, so how does the cell respond to this? This is bad, basically. You need to do something about this. Well, basically, there are certain proteins which become active when uh, they recognize uh, damage to DNA, basically. Okay, and two examples of proteins which become active upon recognizing DNA damage are ataxia telangiectasia mutated. So this is ataxia telangiectasia mutated. Okay, and uh, often ataxia telangiectasia mutated protein uh, is abbreviated to ATN. So this is one of these proteins that can uh, that can recognize DNA double strand breaks and will uh, become an active kinase enzyme when it uh, s when double strand breaks are recognized by it. When it sees a double strand break, it will become active. Another example of a protein which can be activated by double strand breaks or other DNA damages. So this is just an example of DNA damage. More generally, we're just talking about DNA damage activating uh, downstream pathways. So another example of a protein which can be activated by uh, DNA damage 
is ataxia telangiectasia and rad free related peptide ataxia telangiectasia rad free related protein okay rad free related protein right so this is usually um, denoted a TR for ataxia telangiectasia and then rad free related protein. So this is ATR. Right, so when the DNA gets damaged, an example of which is this double strand break that I've shown you here, these two proteins will be activated. ATM and ATR will be activated. And they are both serine threonine kinases. So both of these are under the category of serine threonine kinases. Okay, so they phosphorylate serine and threonine residues. Now, for our purposes, they both do essentially the same thing. So from now on, I will relate, I will refer to ATM slash ATR, by which I mean either ATM or or ATR. I don't mean some sort of chimera of both. I mean one or the other, but they're both doing effectively the same thing. Okay, so they are a serine threonine kinase, which I will denote by uh, this sort of archetypal enzyme with its active site here. Okay, so basically what they're going to do is they're going to become active when they recognize some DNA damage, such as this double strand break which we've drawn, and they're going to now phosphorylate serine and threonine residues on other proteins. And two proteins which are targets for serine threonine kinase are uh, the checkpoint kinase 1 enzyme. Okay, so checkpoint um, kinase 1 enzyme and checkpoint kinase 2. Okay, so checkpoint kinase 1 or checkpoint kinase 2. And these are often abbreviated to CHK. 1 slash CHK2. So the checkpoint kinase 1 and the checkpoint kinase 2, they're both also serine threonine kinases, which are basically acted, uh, oh, sorry, are activated when they are phosphorylated by the ataxia telangiectasia uh, mutated slash ataxia telangiectasia rad free related protein. So these get phosphorylated the check 1 and the check 2 uh, get phosphorylated and when they are phosphorylated they become active. So, so far what we have seen is that when DNA is damaged it activates the ataxia telangiectasia mutated protein or the ataxia telangiectasia rad free related protein, so ATM or ATR. Those then phosphorylate the checkpoint kinase 1 or the checkpoint kinase 2. Now, what does the checkpoint kinase 1 and checkpoint kinase 2 then do? Well, it phosphorylates the protein P53 and that activates it, but we need to see why that activates it. So, what usually prevents the activity of P53? Well, basically, in a normal cell that doesn't need P53 active because DNA damage hasn't occurred, uh, the cell is making P53 all the time. So how come you don't get active P53? Well, basically, the reason you don't get active P53 is that the moment the P53 has been made, another protein comes and binds to it. And this other protein is known as MDM2, which stands for something like mouse dependent minute 2 or something ridiculous like that. Um, named because it was discovered in experimental animals. Okay, um, so um, MDM2 comes and binds to P53 and that stops the P53 from functioning, but more than that, MDM2 then targets P53 for ubiquitination. So basically the uh, P53 molecule has a ubiquitin group added onto it. So this here is a ubiquitin group and we'll have this in uh, purple. Okay, so here is our ubiquitin group stuck on the side of the P53. Now, things which get ubiquitin stuck on them get destroyed by the proteasome. So this is going to be destroyed by the proteasome over here. Alright, so basically that is why P53 is not active in normal cells. You make it to destroy it. 
The moment it's made, it gets bound to by MDM2, then it gets ubiquitinated, and then it goes through the proteasome and is destroyed. It may seem quite wasteful, uh, but that's the way it's done. So, uh, the way the checkpoint kinase 1 and the checkpoint kinase 2 stop this process from happening is when the P53 is made, what they do is they phosphorylate it. So they stick a phosphate group onto it, and once they've stuck a phosphate group onto it, MDM2 cannot bind to it. So the P53 gets to survive, basically, because MDM2 can't bind to it with this phosphate group on it. Now, when the um, P53 um, when the P53 is then active, what it does is it forms um, tetramers. So let me show this down here. So it forms tetramers like so. Okay, and uh, these tetramers go into the nucleus and uh, they will bind to promoter regions on genes and they will alter the transcription of the target genes, basically. So P53 forms a tetramer, which is then a transcription factor, and that's how it alters um, cellular activity. So let's say this is the DNA here, and P53 has bound to uh, the promoter region of some gene, of the target genes. Okay, so here's the DNA. So let's say this is the gene here, Okay, and this is the promoter region here, and I've drawn the promoter region far bigger than a gene, but never mind. Okay, so um, we'll have the promoter region in orange, and we'll have the gene in um, pink. Right, so what's going to happen is P53 tetramer is going to bind to promoter regions. That's going to increase the affinity of um, the promoter region for RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase is going to come in here, begin the transcription of this gene, and because you've bound the P53 there, you're going to get increased transcription of this gene here. So, uh, you increase the transcription of a bunch of genes. Now, which genes do you increase the transcription of? Well, firstly, you're going to increase the transcription of genes which make proteins involved in DNA repair. That seems logical. You have had DNA damage. That's the whole reason the P53 got activated in the first place. So you need to make uh, proteins which are going to go and try and repair that DNA damage. So DNA repair mechanisms will be activated and you'll make basically the tools for the job. Okay? You also make the uh, tumor, well, you make the tumor suppressor gene. Uh, active, which is P21. So you make lots of P21 protein. This, as we've seen uh, previously in uh, the uh, transforming growth factor uh, beta pathway, arrests the cell cycle. Arrests cell cycle. So it stops the cell dividing. That is a sensible thing to do. If you have got a cell which has damaged DNA, you do not want it going through the division process. Firstly, because it risks passing on mutations down to the next generation. Secondly, um, it also risks major havoc. What if you've got a double-strand break? What's going to happen at mitosis when, these, uh, when the sister chromatids should be pulling apart if you've got a massive great double strand break things could go seriously wrong you could get chromosomal havoc um, okay so um, arresting the cell cycle is a good idea and basically if you have very high levels of p53 for a prolonged period of time that indicates that the dna repair mechanisms are not working and that the dna is just remaining damaged basically and if that's the case what it will do is it will uh, transcribe pro apoptotic proteins specifically it will transcribe puma and noxa noxa okay Right, so Puma and Noxa are uh, two pro-apoptotic proteins which will lead to the intrinsic pathway of apoptosis being activated. Now, this is the healthy pathway of P53. This is the pathway of P53 that protects you from DNA damage, from major diagenetic havoc in your cells. What happens if P53 loses its function? What happens if you get absolutely no functional p53 then basically this entire pathway doesn't work anymore you get dna damage and you do not get dna repair mechanisms active you do not 
get a resting of the cell cycle. You do not get apoptosis. You get complete loss of all the genetic protection. So P53 is often given the grandiose title of the guardian of the genome. And it really, really is. It's protecting the genome uh, from uh, havoc, basically, from terrible uh, mutations, basically. Okay, so in the next video, we'll talk about what's going to happen in these um, late adenoma cells.